Benchmark, the voice of business. Presented by LMD. this edition of Benchmark. We focus on Budget 2014 today as we talk to Dr. Dushne Virakul, the Deputy Director and Fellow of the Institute of Policy Studies of Sri Lanka. Then Nielsen's Managing Director Shaheen Kader offers his perspective on the Business Confidence Index which advanced by 8 basis points. And we wrap up the show with economist and LMD columnist Deshal Dimel who discusses Sri Lanka's macro outlook. That's the lineup for Benchmark. Hello and welcome to the Big Picture Business Program Benchmark. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. President Mahindra Rajapaksa presented the fiscal budget for 2014 in Parliament a few weeks ago. But as is normally the case, there was much debate and discussion on the budget proposals that were presented. To put it all in perspective, we have in our studios today Dr. Dushni Virakon, and she is the Deputy Director and Fellow of the Institute of Policy Studies of Sri Lanka. Dushni, good to have you in our studios and I'm so glad you're here to discuss the budget. What is your opinion of the proposals that were presented? Um, the budget uh, this year, I think there were no major surprises in the budget. If you look at the um, expenditure proposals, they are mostly in line with uh, what has already been implemented or what is already in the pipeline for implementation. And underpins the kind of thinking, I think, behind the government's overall policy framework, the Mahindra Chintana document support for the SME sector, some support for agriculture, domestic agriculture sector, etc. Um, in terms of the revenue proposals as well, um, I don't see any departure from the kind of line that the government has taken over the last two to three years, reduction of uh, income uh, tax rates, etc. Um, just sort of continuing with what they have been doing over the last two or three years. So, Overall, uh, a fairly sort of um, a, a budget that has continuity. So, however, we have seen uh, an increase in import duties and certain cess levies and things like that, and that's expected to raise something like 12.7 billion rupees. Uh, do you believe that the somewhat protectionist tone of the budget that we are seeing is in the interest of long-term sustainable economic growth? Well, um, I think the government has been providing um, protection to select sectors, uh, for instance, to the uh, farmers by imposing uh, duties on some uh, uh, products with which domestic uh, farmers compete. And that has now been extended to the dairy product sector as well. You could argue that protection for these kinds of sectors, um, you can live with it because we are you know, immediate uh, term, Sri Lanka is not going to be competing in international markets uh, exporting these sectors. The concern, I think, is uh, in the 2014 budget, uh, we see that kind of selective protection also being extended to some of the industrial sectors. For instance, uh, BOI companies are being encouraged to source inputs uh, like tiles and other building materials um, from domestic manufacturers. Um, that kind of uh, policy signaling that you know, there is some degree of uh, creeping protectionism coming into our um, trade policy, I think we need to watch out for, uh, because uh, Sri Lanka with a consumer base of 20 million, um, we can't uh, rely on the domestic uh, consumer base to drive growth of 8% plus in the long term. It has to come via a vibrant and uh, dynamic export sector. Technically, it's not looking too healthy if this kind of trend continues. No, I think uh, Sri Lanka has, you know, our uh, growth has been fairly uh, buoyant. We've seen 7% uh, growth or so on average. But that growth in the recent years has come from um, the sort of infrastructure development drive uh, that has uh, been sort of the primary focus in government uh, uh, policy. Now, at some point, um, that growth drive is going to slow down and we need to be ready to shift gear uh, and sustain the growth momentum through um, uh, the export sector. It has to come from the export sector uh, because in the last four or five years what you see is that you know export earnings may have uh, increased in absolute terms but as a percentage of GDP it has declined. 
clearly suggesting that the higher growth we are seeing uh, today is not being driven by um, uh, export push, but more uh, through domestic uh, demand. And that is not a long-term sustainable uh, growth process. How do you feel the exporters are feeling after the budget proposals? Well, I think um, the exporters, there, there wasn't anything very specifically targeted um, to the export sector. Uh, and I think that is a policy gap that we really need to um, uh, fix because the exporters are facing sort of um, problems on several fronts. One, of course, major problem is that there is a global economic crisis. Uh, the key export markets for Sri Lanka, the US, EU, um, those regions are not doing too well. Uh, and Sri Lanka is, over time, we've been losing uh, market share globally. So it is a matter of also domestic competitiveness of the export sector in terms of energy prices, in terms of our exchange rate policy management, in terms of bringing a, a broad sort of export strategy in place, pursuing regional um, trade agreements. We've been very quiet uh, on these fronts. So I think at some point, um, the export sector has to be given a more sort of prominent uh, place in the policy discussion. You know, we're thinking of increasing our revenue target by 21%, something like 1.437 billion rupees. Do you feel that this is realistic, given the ground situation? I think that in the 2014 budget, um, the revenue target is, uh, is it's much more conservative estimate than what um, budgets have proposed earlier. The revenue target for 2014 is 14.5% of GDP, which is the same revenue target that they set for the 2013 budget. Now, if you look at the um, actual figures, the government, uh, I think up to um, November or so, the, it suggests that the revenue to GDP, the actual figure is about 13.8%. Now, if you take that as a base, uh, and on top of that, they have introduced a few additional revenue measures in the 2014 budget, then I think it's somewhat realistic to assume that we can get fairly close to that 14.5% um, revenue target that has been set. Um, I would think that uh, it is a more realistic uh, revenue target than what we've seen over the last two, three years. Now, in addition to widening the VAT base applicable to supermarkets and numerous price increases through the now familiar Gazette notification, don't you think it's highly likely that the cost of living will actually rise quite appreciably? The cost of living will rise um, because if you take the Colombo Consumer Price Index, um, food and uh, beverages <clears throat> make up 40% uh, um, of that basket. Now, whether it will rise appreciably, I think it's, it's still not clear because the, the, um, there have been tariffs, higher import duties uh, imposed on some of imported uh, agricultural products and processed agricultural products. And of course, the extension of the um, uh, VAT to the retail sector. Now, if, if there is an appreciable um, price increase, it will in turn lead to what we call the price wage spiral, that there will be demand for wage increases to accommodate that uh, uh, higher cost of living, and then it becomes a vicious um, uh, cycle. Now, in, in the current uh, overall sort of moderate inflationary environment that we are seeing, um, my sense is that, yes, there will be an increase in um, inflation as a result of these price adjustments. But it may not necessarily lead to a wage price spiral. If at all, um, inflationary pressures in the Sri Lankan economy is going to come from the current uh, sort of uh, aggressive easing of monetary policy that is being uh, pushed. Uh, to bring interest rates down, to push um, credit growth to the uh, private sector. Now, that will start catching up sometime next year when economic activity pe uh, picks up, credit demand by the private sector picks up. Uh, and then they will have to sort of look at their policy options, um, whether you want to sort of end the priority is to get 8% growth or whether you moderate growth uh, and keep uh, an eye on price um, stability. To my, um, my assessment really is that uh, the inflationary pressures um, will come from the supply side. So let's continue this conversation after a break. Time for a commercial break now. On the other side, Dr. Dushti discusses proposals on allowing foreign nationals to own land and 
It's the steps being taken to address Sri Lanka's trade deficit. Stay with us. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. Thank you for staying with us on Benchmark. We now continue with our exclusive discussion on Budget 2014 with Dr. Dushni Virakon, Deputy Director and Fellow of the Institute of Policy Studies of Sri Lanka. Dushni, you know, the real estate sector is very uh, crucial to our FDI prospects. How do you view the proposals regarding the foreign ownership of land, given this importance? If you look at, um, in a sort of a comparative context, most countries, whether you look at Asia, Latin America, Africa, or even developed countries, they, they do have some form of restrictions and regulations with regards to foreign ownership of land, whether for commercial purposes or private ownership. So the first point I think is that Sri Lanka is not unique in introducing um, these kinds of um, uh, regulations. The impact it will have on foreign investors I think also will depend on the sector of investment that they're interested in. For instance, if you take um, an investor that is looking at Sri Lanka from a locational um, advantage point of view, say for instance tourism, they may factor in the um, proposed uh, land tax uh, and still consider that there is a comparative advantage in bringing their investments into, into the country. On the other hand, if you have an investment investor that is sort of more into, say, light engineering and they're somewhat more indifferent between choice of location, say, between in Sri Lanka and Vietnam, for instance, then cost matters. And one will be, of course, the um, tax on the uh, lease of land to foreign uh, investors. There, I think it's still not clear how that tax will be implemented, whether it will be on an annualized basis or there will be an upfront payment. Um, but it seems very clear that uh, this is being introduced um, and I think it is um, Sri Lanka has to then look at the whole sort of, there's a whole um, list of um, areas that foreign investors look at, macro stability in a country, the legal procedures, the rule of law, uh, transparency, accountability in the way that you um, uh, permit foreign investment. We have to ensure that our scorecard on all these other areas is um, very much stronger in the coming years uh, uh, in order to sort of um, ensure that this is not a deterrent to those investors that um, take sort of a, you know, they may have three, four countries that they look at and decide their investment decisions purely based on uh, cost factors. Are there sufficient steps being taken to address Sri Lanka's trade deficit? The main steps that have been taken um, to bridge um, our trade deficit is actually on the import side. Uh, there have been revisions to import uh, tariffs, uh, uh, especially on vehicle imports. When vehicle import tariffs were brought down, they couldn't sort of, have the trade deficit was ballooning. The, uh, imports were sort of re uh, um, uh, duties were reimposed. That is trying to manage your trade balance through import compression. We are not looking at um, trying to improve our trade deficit th uh, via the export sector, and I think that is where uh, the main sort of policy gap is. As I mentioned earlier, that 
very little attention is being paid to how we can improve uh, export earnings in um, goods as well as in um, services. Uh, and that requires a whole new sort of um, strategic approach to um, promoting um, export sector growth. Um, looking at all the cost factors that are impinging on export competitiveness, the policy factors, exchange rate. Um, so the current sort of approach to um, handling the trade balance issue is, is, is a very sort of a one-sided approach. Nishni, there have been accolades and brick, equal brickbats for the country's infrastructure development programs. There are the critics and there are the, the ESAs. Now, do you think our large-scale infrastructure projects are actually being implemented? in a sustainable manner? The sustainability of the um, infrastructure program, I think it really boils down to financing. Um, many developing countries, um, they have huge infrastructure uh, investment needs. Financing is a problem um, for them as well. Now, Sri Lanka has opted to rely heavily on foreign borrowing to finance our infrastructure through bilateral loans, through um, the issuing of sovereign bonds, etc. Now, when you go down that path, um, there is, it's almost uh, it's incumbent that we do very um, strong cost-benefit analysis to ensure that the money that is invested will give um, a return on that investment for us to um, service um, that debt in the coming years. So we have a mixed bag of um, large-scale infrastructure programs. I think there are some projects like the expansion of the Colombo port, which has long uh, been recognized as a sort of a, a much needed um, investment. It will enhance um, and bring down costs of our um, export sector and give us uh, foreign exchange earnings. In the same way, I think there are other projects where the investments will, be, will take much longer uh, for us to sort of see, for instance, Hambantara Port, the Matal International Airport, there the returns may take um, uh, very much longer. So in terms of the overall sort of investment uh, drive that we are seeing, again, um, a concern is that whilst we are borrowing, uh, 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 resorting to foreign borrowing for the investment, we are actually seeing our foreign exchange earnings uh, not keeping pace with the accumulation of um, foreign debt. So that trend has to reverse, uh, otherwise this model of financing is not uh, sustainable in the long term. Do you think the present path of fiscal and monetary policy is by and large the right one that we are following? What do you see, uh, what should our overall economic strategy be in the next decade or so? The fiscal, on the fiscal front, I think the um, overall sort of trends are in the right direction. Ensuring that we are cutting current expenditure, but growing public investment and bringing the deficit down. And monetary policy keeps sort of um, adjusting um, uh, once the government, go government has set a, a GDP growth target for the year. But to make sure that we keep growing at 8% for a 10-year um, span, um, I think much more needs to be done. It's, it's not simply fiscal or monetary policy. It's also the structural reforms that have to come in. If you um, take the current growth um, is being driven by construction and related sectors, but taking a 10-year um, sort of view, Sri Lanka is a aging population. The number of um, entrants into the labor market is declining each year, irrespective of the low um, female labor force participation rate, of course. But it means that for us to keep growing at 8% uh, over a long period, we need to rely on labor productivity to drive that growth. Now, the current growth is generating employment in uh, low productivity sectors, tourism, um, construction, retail, wholesale, trade. And that is not going to be sufficient to get that structural transformation of the economy. Um, yeah, we sh sort of move the 30% or so of the labor force in agriculture into manufacturing and services. So we need to look at technological development, skills upgrading, ensure that our labor force uh, productivity um, is sort of the driver behind higher growth in the next 10 years.
and that requires reforms, education sector reforms, labor market uh, reforms, um, and that set of reforms are yet to be addressed, I think. Well, we can all live in hope. Thank you very much, Dushni, for chatting with us today. That was Dr. Dushni Burekon, Deputy Director and Fellow of the Institute of Policy Studies of Sri Lanka. On the other, other side, discussing the Business Confidence Index is Shaheen Khader, Managing Director of Nielsen, and giving his analysis on the economy, economist and LMD columnist Deshal Dimel. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Hello and welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Anushan Selvaraj and with me now is the Managing Director of Nielsen, Shaheen Kader, to give us the latest on the Business Confidence Index. Now, Shaheen, the latest BCI is up by eight basis points. Now, could you walk us through the factors that have led to this? Yeah, I, actually, Anushan, I think it's up for the second month in a, in a row, so which is interesting and good news, hopefully. Uh, it's, I think, uh, multifold reasons. A decline in, the, in inflation is, I think, one reason because there's more stability and easier to manage the business uh, revenues and profits. Uh, at the same time, respondents have also commented on shogam and also the increase in um, sort of the tourism that is taking place. So there's some sort of optimism, optimism hopefully uh, building up in the economy. And uh, this is actually combined with um, a rise in the consumer confidence index as well, which was unprecedented compared to previous months. Now, sentiments uh, remain upbeat about economic prospects for the next 12 months. Uh, now, what reasons have been given for this positive outlook? I think infrastructure development uh, seems to be paying dividends, uh, Anushan, because of the increase in optimism about the economy and the business outlook in 2014. I think it's also combined with uh, more exchange rate being somewhat uh, sort of stable in a sense. Shine, what trends have you observed in terms of confidence in the investment climate now? Uh, the ups and downs, so to speak. I think uh, the big trend positively is the global economic recovery. Uh, for instance, 30% were concerned about the global economy in this survey in June, compared to only 7% uh, in the latest November poll. And uh, on the other hand, uh, I think uh, there is greater expectation from the public service. For example, 25% uh, were concerned of the inefficiency of public services in June, and that has gone up now to about 39%. That was the Managing Director of Nielsen, Shaheen Kader. After a short commercial break, we will be back with the latest on the economy with Deshal Dimel. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC.
Welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Anushan Selvaraja and with me now is economist and LMD columnist Deshal Dimel to give us a few insights into the economy. Now, Deshal, give us a brief overview of the economy at its current stage. Yeah, Anshan, in uh, recent, recent quarters, we've seen a, a gradual improvement in overall economic growth as well. The third quarter, uh, sorry, the, yeah, third quarter figures uh, came out quite positively at 7.8% uh, growth. And that is, uh, it's an improvement from, uh, from the first half, so certainly, and that is also fairly broad-based. In terms of uh, in terms of growth in agriculture, industry, and uh, services, and I think that's uh, generally a positive sign. Um, I think there are some areas where there is still a little bit of a uh, little bit of slack. We haven't really seen significant growth in uh, demand for credit as yet, and I think that is really an issue of of matter of confidence. Once the once the confidence starts to uh, come back into the economy, and I think we are seeing some early signs of that. Uh, but thus far, on certainly on the on the growth sector, it's it's uh, looking quite good. Other macroeconomic uh, fundamentals also seem to be quite uh, benign and supportive of uh, of future growth. A lot of interesting new uh, new projects that are in the pipeline as well. So going forward, it's quite uh, uh, it seems to be at a quite quite a positive uh, level overall. Do you believe that inflation is likely to remain close to the six percent mark, uh, especially after the budget uh, 2014 was announced? Well, I think if you look at it from a historical perspective, inflation in, inflation environment that we are seeing today is very positive compared to what it was in the past. We are used to inflation of 10% and above. Central Bank, I think, has done a, a very good job in bringing this down to the mid-single digit levels that they have uh, that they have envisaged, and it has so far been uh, quite credible in terms of this uh, in terms of this aspiration. Now we have noted that. In, uh, at, at present, has come down to about six uh, percent. There were some changes in the budget that uh, that increased some of the taxes on particularly imported products and uh, some of the VAT implications on domestic uh, products as well. And that would cause probably a temporary uh, a temporary rise in the in the overall price level in some of those uh, categories. Um, but I don't think that it's going to really contribute significantly to overall inflation in 2014. If you look at co-inflation, uh, which is a measure of uh, inflation excluding some of the more volatile uh, products, that has really come down to historical lows of 2.6% in, in November. And that is really what you worry about from, a, 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 from say, a macroeconomic perspective is co-inflation. The fact that that has come down to very low levels is really reflective of um, of demand of a fairly effective demand management, and I think if that can be maintained at uh, at these levels, or there's still space for it to go up a little bit more. But I think in general we should be able to achieve mid single digit levels in 2014 as well, supported by uh, global commodity prices as well. We've seen again, uh, uh, for instance, this, the recent agreement uh, with Iran, which will hopefully keep uh, crude oil prices down as well. And I think that will also be supportive of uh, of achieving uh, of achieving mid single digit in uh, going forward as well. Deshal, how has the country performed on the external trade front? Again, in the last uh, few months, we've seen improvements, particularly on the export side. In we saw in 2012 and the first half of 2013, exports were pretty much um, contracting on a on a monthly basis. But in the last three months, there's been uh, fairly fairly strong growth. We saw growth in apparel, growth in uh, tea exports and in some of the other industrial exports as well. So that has certainly been quite positive. I think it's been helped by some of the improvements in the economies, uh, our major export markets that has certainly helped us out. Um, but I still think there's a long way to go in terms of improving our overall export positions. We are still at the levels that we were at in 2011. So even though it's growth compared to 2012, there's still, I think, there's much room for uh, for, for further growth in terms of where we would want to be. On the import side, um, it has kind of been fluctuating. Certain, some months it's been growing, some months it's been staying stagnant. But by and large, it's been remaining at a fairly, uh, fairly consistent level. It hasn't, we haven't really seen uh, a sharp rise in imports that you would expect to see when interest rates come down the way that interest rates have come down. Uh, and I think that is quite positive. It's, uh, it's quite supportive of our overall uh, external position because Basically, it has enabled us to maintain a relatively sustainable trade deficit, which we are able to uh, we are able to mitigate through to our remittances, earnings from tourism services, and so on. So, at the moment, the external position I would say is fairly sustainable. Room for improvement, continued improvement in the export front. That was economist and LMD columnist Deshal Dimel. Thank you for watching Benchmark, and we hope to see you again next time.